Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. I'm Laura Ajege, a course lead here at MIT CTL for the MicroMasters in SEM program. And I'm co-hosting this live event today with Kellen Betts, also a course lead here at the MicroMasters program. Today, we are extremely fortunate to have Mr. Pradeep Kumar with us. Pradeep is the Director of Advanced Engineering at Walmart. So welcome, Pradeep. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction. And uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today. I'm looking forward for the discussion. Awesome. So to everyone in our audience, and if you have joined us before, you already know we love to kick off our events with a poll. So we would like to know now, why are you joining the audience today? Is it that you're here to learn more about information, like automation in general? And are you here to learn more specifically for distribution centers, techniques, or processes, or willing to implement automation and you don't know where to start or want to get some recommendations? So while we let you populate the poll, um, let's go with Kellen, who will share us the agenda for the session. Awesome. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome, Pardeep, and thank you, Laura. Um, so for the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to discuss automation with Pardeep, um, focusing on the distribution center as a context, and we'll you know, discuss some examples on how to identify opportunities with automation, uh, maybe make or buy technology, you know, some of the trade-offs that come with automation, um, you know, technology considerations, and a number of other exciting topics. Um, and so the, for the last 15 minutes or so, you know, we'll definitely save some time for the questions from the audience. And so please start thinking of those. Um, and please use that Q&A feature, that Zoom Q&A button there on the bottom um, to ask your questions. We'll keep an eye on the chat as well, but it's much easier for us to um, keep an eye on that Q&A if you have questions. Love to see post introductions, you know, introduce yourself, where you're from, maybe maybe Usman, I see your, your first one in there as well. So, you know, great. Use that chat to connect with the, the audience, but please use that Q&A for asking questions. Um, and then also make sure that you're logged in with a name. We won't be um, asking or we won't be pulling questions from the audience um, that are anonymous. Awesome. So with that, maybe we'll close this first poll and we'll take a look at our results from this first poll here. So the question was, why are you here today? I'm interested in learning a little bit more about what you're hoping to get out of today's session. Um, it looks like a lot, you know, um, you know, 30% of you are looking to see automation, how it can improve supply chain performance. And so that's great. Um, also, good, awesome to see here, you know, some MicroMasters learners here who don't miss any webinars. It's always awesome to see if you you here do, as well. Um, Pradeep, I don't know if you have any thoughts on those re poll results there. Absolutely. I think that's exactly what uh, we wanted. People who were enthusiastic about learning automation and supply chain and uh, looks like uh, uh, most of our participants are, are looking to that. So, yes, I think we should be able to cover most of those topics. Awesome. So with that, are you ready to kick things off, Pardeep? Are you ready to get, get started here? Absolutely. Let's go. Great. Well, can you maybe just share just a little bit more about your background, um, you know, kind of your, your journey and your story of how you got to where you are today? And Sure. Uh, my name is Pardeep Kumar. Uh, I'm an automation enthusiast, or at least that's how I would like to call myself. Uh, I'm in this field for about uh, more than uh, 15 years. And uh, first seven years was working for small scale industry, designing automation equipment for food and pharmaceutical industry. And the next eight years was spent in engineering and supply chain roles in one of the large CPG company based in uh, based in US. Uh, in most recent role, I'm helping automate processes in the distribution centers for uh, retail industry. Uh, in summary, uh, I'm an engineer who likes to solve problem as uh, most of us on the call. Certainly, that's what most people in this call is. So thank you for sharing that. And that's a very interesting background. And we're hoping to learn a lot from you today and your experience. Um, but before diving into the details of automation processes and specific technologies, we want to start at a very high level on ask you why, why a company would want to automate a process in thinking on distribution centers or any other operations. And with that, you know, a lot of questions come to our mind. So I'm going to share those with you, but feel free to share any of them. Um, so what are some of the strategies to identify opportunities for automation? And once you get those opportunities, how to sell those to the leadership, how to get that buy-in? And then yeah. once into that, how do you think you can measure the results, measure the success, show them that the opportunities uh, was fruitful? 
Very good question, Laura. I know your question has a lot of different parts to it. Maybe uh, let me try to address it uh, uh, step by step. I think the first one I heard was why automate? Uh, for example, let's say in any warehouse, we are handling a lot of cases. You're unloading and loading onto the trailers, removing cases from the pallets, adding cases to the pallets. There are multiple parameters to consider in these operations that will trigger the need for automation. So some of the factors that why automate is some of the factors that may require automation are you want to improve safety and ergonomics in your distribution centers, right? Improving the associate experience. So there are workers in the warehouse. How do you improve their experience in certain tasks that they're doing? Increase in reliability of service to the end customer. Everything we do in the supply chain is, is focused on, is it creating value to the end customer? If you're not doing that, you're doing something wrong, right? So capacity increases, increase in rate of production. Let's say you are measuring your cases per hour, you're doing 100 cases per hour, how do you get to 200 cases per hour? Reducing the error rate and improving the quality of the operation. So all these factors would be, it's like why we automate. I think the next part of your question was, what are the strategies to automate? You know, sometimes we think about strategies and maybe we think, oh, strategy has to be something like very, it's a hard task. No, it's it's very simple. I think really kind of breaking down the problem and looking at the, how are you going to solve it? So according to me, I think key is understanding the current state of your supply chain. Identify the opportunity areas that need attention, let's say from safety, cost, reliability, or any other KPIs you want to drive in your supply chain. Build a future state process that you want to target. So let's say, for example, you say, I want to improve safety by 50%. I want to reduce cost by 10%. I want to increase reliability by 30%. So you define those targets. So based on those targets, let's start exploring the market. Understand the type of technologies available to get to the desired future state. What is the readiness level of those technologies? Are these concepts only, or I can place a PO today, buy an equipment and create immediate value in the supply chain. So these are some of the ways you can kind of strategize on how do you go about finding an automation technology? The other part is like, how do you measure value? So value can be measured by the KPIs you're trying to drive. KPIs can vary with type of automation systems you're designing. Like for this example, I'll, I'll use case manipulation. Case manipulation is anything to do with cases as long as you're moving cases within warehouse. So you may be taking cases from the trailer, putting it on a conveyor. You may be taking cases from a pallet, putting it on a conveyor or building a pallet with cases. So anything to do with movement of cases, we call it like case manipulation. So some of the KPIs in case manipulation space would be cases per hour. Very simple. You're doing 100 cases, how do you get to 200? Asset availability. What is the percentage of your asset availability? Is your asset always available? 90% of the time it's available or 95% of the time it's available? Because you have to figure in, you always have to you know, stop the asset and maintain the asset. And sometimes your associates will have to go in and address some interventions. So maybe let's target, let's say 90% asset availability. Anything lower than that, you have issues, but you can work with automation to increase the asset availability. Error rate would be another one, OEE. So OEE is very standard for any automation equipment, like overall equipment eff effectiveness. So this is how you could kind of quantify the value generated by automation. I think the last piece, uh, a lot of that you mentioned was, how do you get leadership buy-in? So kind of like what we just went through is, do you understand your current state? Do you understand what is the future state you're targeting? You have KPIs identified. At that point, you start doing cost versus effort analysis. Calculate the business value that can be driven. So maybe calculate IRR, internal rate of return, like what, what is the financial value and other values you can create. At that point, I think you're ready to share these ideas with stakeholders and the leaders to get buy-in. You know, you obviously have to maybe take them along with the journey while you're identifying the KPIs, but at that point, you're truly ready to get the leadership buy-in because you've done that exercise.
So hopefully I give you the answer to what you were looking for. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, um, Pardeep. You know, great to kind of hear your perspective on, you know, supply chains, even within a distribution center can be so complex. You know, there's so many moving parts. And so to kind of break it down, you know, focus in on understanding what your current state is, you know, identify your, your KPIs and, and and then proceed from there. It's a, it's a fascinating approach. So maybe just kind of building off of that um, that approach that you just mentioned, you know, once you have that identifier, that opportunity identified, you kind of have your target, your metrics, um, you know, establish what you're going for, maybe improving safety or reducing error rate or whatever it happens to be. Uh, maybe the next step in kind of dialing in on the technology piece, you know, what are some of the strategies to identify what the te right technologies are for this opportunity, right? Um, you know, should you, if you're a company that maybe has some resources, should you build that technology yourself? Should you buy that technology from a, you know, supplier in the marketplace? Um, and then how do you select those suppliers if you're going to, you know, work with a vendor or partner? How do you um, go about selecting those suppliers or those partners in the marketplace? Absolutely. And I think this is a, uh... A very common challenge when you are looking to solve an automation problem, you always have an opportunity to build it internally or opportunity to go buy it in the market. And sometimes the solution kind of lies in between. So I think uh, a definitely a critical step in the problem solving strategy. Something I'm familiar with is methodology called technology readiness level. I think we have a slide for that, uh, Kellen. I think uh, it was uh, slide number one, if you could share that. Yeah, perfect. So I think obviously starts with the scope of what exactly you're looking for. So defining the scope of the problem you're trying to solve. So what we do is in this particular process is we explore the market, evaluate the capability demonstrations from solution providers and categorize them into this technology readiness level or TRL is how we would refer it. So for example, like the bottommost is TRL1 category. TRL1 category will be the supplier who has concept only and does not have a prototype to show. So for example, they may have a AutoCAD layout or a 3D model of the solution. They think this is, this is how they're going to solve your problem. So we categorize them into TRL1 because they do not have a prototype to show. As compared to TRL5, is the supplier who has mature product, which has been tested and tried in the market, is something that can create immediate value in the distribution space. All others like TRL2, TRL3, TRL4 are similar categories. Higher the number, higher is the maturity level of the product. So, because when you go out in the market, you, you are you see multiple options out there and very difficult to select hey, which supplier and very difficult to objectively select what supplier you want to go with. So TRL categorization of suppliers in this way really helps kind of building some objective selection process in, in the technology. So coming back to kind of like make versus why, suppliers classified in the higher TRL categories are most likely to be selected because they're ready to go, right? That being said, there are other important factors that may impact the decision making. Uh, that could be a supplier's ability to scale. Maybe they're a smaller company, they're not ready to scale. Uh, what is the cost of solution? Because if the cost is not right, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't help us. Resource availability and other things, right? So it's a standard process we kind of go through while we're selecting a supplier. So you said make versus buy. There's a lot of pros and cons to both approaches. Something to consider for make making it yourself approach is availability of right skill set and resources in your team. Do you even have the resources and skill set in your team to build those solutions? So, for example, if market is let's say immature in technology readiness, so you are looking for something you think market does not have that, it is high likelihood to make that internally. Probably there, there was an issue with Pradeep's connectivity, but I was very excited to see Kellen. I don't know if you did also, but in our SE2X course, we usually have um, a finance piece of it, and it's very hard to connect people to finance. And I love the fact that he brought the buy in uh, connected with sharing financial um, status and um, techniques like the IRR. And also here, because he's sharing a framework about technology readiness, and I think part of it is back, um, the fact that we have a framework that we actually apply in the real world and in the real uh, 
operation and issues we we have to face every day so i don't know kellen if you found that sorry guys uh, i'm back now can you guys hear me oh yeah welcome back okay perks perks of working remotely so no problem i, I think you finished with the answer but i don't know if you wanted me to share the slide again or if we want to move on to that yeah answer. sure i think uh, i was kind of talking about uh make option Maybe let me close that comment. Uh, I don't know if it went through. Okay. If you could flash the slide again, I think we were kind of talking about make versus buy. And, and I think I was giving an example of if market is immature in technology readiness, I think it's high likelihood to, to make that product internally. This way you can control your roadmap and build robust solutions purely based on your needs versus waiting for the industry to prioritize developing that solution. Awesome. Let me stop sharing so that I can see you back. And I, I was saying, I, I appreciate the fact that you brought this framework because this is not something that we usually see from the supply chain perspective itself, but we do deal with the bank versus by um, decision. And it's very interesting to see how you, you apply it on a specific industry or a specific need. Uh, so thank you for bringing that to our audience. Um, I'm going uh, to another topic now, and as you explained before, we use automation uh, for different tasks, for different uh, improvement opportunities. And I'm now thinking on perhaps uh, the situation of planning a new facility. When we're thinking on a new facility or in um, the way we design our network, we don't only need to design how the facility is um, within it if, if we need to have consider a certain size of a place or, or a location, a certain specific location for that facility or how to design the flow within it. So um, based on your experience, when does automation come into that conversation when we're thinking on designing a new facility or when we're thinking where to locate it? Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a very good question. And uh, especially while designing a new facility, a lot of factors needs to be considered. Like, for example, what is the desired output of that facility? You know, you don't build new buildings just for line of sight of one to two years. So consider the desired output from that warehouse for next 10, 20, 30 years down the line, right? So the other factors could be you know, type of product you want to handle in that particular distribution center. It could be, are you handling an ambient product or you need a product that needs refrigeration, you know, something like grocery and things like that. How, how the product is needs to be received, stored, and shipped in the distribution center. It purely depends upon what product and all those requirements kind of evolve from that. And other capabilities and infrastructure needed to process that volume. For example, you're gonna need barcode scanners, you're gonna need an ability to build pallets, load and unload trailers. So to accommodate all these factors, automation is needed. So most of the time these days, real estate is limited. I think we all know real estate is prime these days, it's, not, it's, it's very expensive. So there is more need nowadays to have more efficient distribution centers than ever. So automation is considered very early in design phase for these new distribution centers, sometimes even before locking the real estate, which makes perfect sense. You, know, you want to design your site before you lock, get landlocked, right? So I think Laurie mentioned something important like network design. Network design has a significant impact on processes and automation systems needed in a particular DC. So when you think of a warehouse, you know, warehouse has an upstream and downstream to it. Yeah, you're designing a warehouse, there is some nodes which are going to actually feed into that warehouse, send product into that warehouse. So you will call it upstream. And there is a few things like this warehouse is going to ship things to other locations, which could be end customer stores or another distribution center. You call it downstream of that warehouse. So there's a warehouse upstream of that, and then there is downstream of that. So give an example. If the warehouse you're designing can only receive palletized loads, all the upstream distribution centers, which is feeding into it, should have the capability to send out palletized loads. 
So it's all interconnected, right? While designing an automation system for one warehouse, you have to think about the whole network. And this is where the network design comes in, where you're building a new, new facility. Uh, you know, that you have to consider a few things and think about how I'm going to get product into that distribution center and out of that distribution center. So it's the whole network that uh, you got to think about. Awesome. Thank you, Pradeep. I love the perspective of kind of taking a step back and thinking about the network or maybe the end-to-end -end supply chain, if you will, um, perspective. You know, sometimes we get so focused on our specific function, like, you know, improving receiving in a warehouse or something like that, that we don't, yeah. and we're maybe trying to optimize or improve uh, a specific process. We don't often maybe consider the um, factors or the considerations upstream or downstream of us, especially outside of our four walls, maybe in, in within that supply chain network. So that's a, it's a great, fascinating perspective for sure. Awesome. We'll, we'll just take a look at the time. I think we have probably time for maybe running our second poll here. So if we could launch that second poll here, we wanted to get your, your input or your, your feedback there in the audience. And so if we could launch poll number two here in the question, and once that goes here is how can um, technology impact warehousing distribution and fulfillment centers? And so some of the options, you know, maybe robotics can speed up labor intensive and repetitive tasks. Maybe machine learning can help identify the best position for fast moving products. And so just kind of want to you know, query the audience out there and kind of get your perspective on how technology can have an impact. Um, and while you take a few minutes to work on that poll there, we'll maybe jump into the next question here. And so kind of then also just along with the topic of the poll, I'm focusing on technology and maybe starting with the software side. Um, and specifically, you know, I think an area that's popular in the news right now is AI and machine learning. Um, but yeah. obviously we want to focus on, you know, automation and AI and machine learning distribution center in the news. It's more like chat GTP and some of these chat bots, um, but it still these brings visibility to these concepts. And I think these are probably powerful tools, not necessarily a chat bot, but AI and machine learning within the yep. context of a distribution center. And so I wonder if you had you know, any perspective on those tools and then maybe if, if there are any like critical gaps or open questions on the software side, um, opportunities that we need to work on to, you know, that will help improve us in the future. Um, from an automation perspective. Absolutely. I know chat GPT is a very top, uh, popular topic these days. Uh, I'm probably the rare one in this group that has not tried my luck in chat GPT yet, but I've been hearing really cool things about it, uh, but yet to experience it. Uh, but coming to, I think, uh, Callum, you bring up a, a pretty very important topic, uh, the AI and machine learning piece of it. I believe... Uh, both of the AI and machine learning, they're integral part of any smart robotic or automation system. Now we're relying on these sophisticated vision systems, motion planning systems and softwares that allows the autonomous movement of components within, within, a, uh, within a system. These systems are designed to learn and get smarter by every repetition. So, there is always room for improvement in software and AI, which is kind of like a, a standard response. But according to me, since most of the solutions are custom designed based on the applications we are working on, it will take us some time to realize the benefit of AI in automation space, but it is very promising. I, I know because I'm part of those, uh, those work, but it, it is very promising. It's just about time of we're, we're going to see some benefits of it. So I give you one example of, you know, think about uh, you have a, a small robotic arm and you have a bin, a plastic bin full of 100 items. You get a customer order and uh, the customer order is to ship a toothbrush, right? So the robotic arm is actually going to go pick up the toothbrush from that bin. Every time, every time the arm is picking up the toothbrush, it is registering the amount of force applied point is picking from, so coordinates is picking from, how fast it's moving, and after picking, where it is dropping, like coordinates of where it's dropping. So next time robot is going to pick up the same item, it is getting better in all those parameters. Essentially improving the efficiency with every pick. It will take us some time to actually realize the benefit of the system, but all the data is stored in the internal network, and it actually further helps in deciding the KPIs for similar systems we're going to design in future. So I think we are at kind of like brink of realizing the benefits of AI and machine learning in automation space. Thank you, Pradeep, and thank you for sharing that example. 
Um, and before moving on, I want to go to the related poll. So if we can share the results now, and probably you can share some insights on that. So for our audience to know, every uh, potential answer was correct. So uh, well done. Um, I can see that most of you um, mentioned about robotics that can speed up labor intensive and repetitive tasks. Um, and some others of you focus on the machine learning answer that can help identify positions for fast moving products and the machine learning for most efficient picking routes. Um, I don't know, Pardeep, if you want to make any comments of, on any of these technologies, uh, we're happy to learn from you. This is uh, my type of audience, so I really like the, the responses uh, coming here. Um, absolutely, I think robotics, I think, kind of gave an example of the, kind of maybe the toothbrush example of how robotics can help speed up the labor intensive and repetitive task. We kind of touched on machine learning. You know, our softwares are getting better every time, uh, you know, we're going through the uh, repetitive process, uh, you know, kind of artificial intelligence is coming in and, and kind of helping us improve the solutions by default, which is, which is I think, very important. IOTs, you know, I think we're going to touch on that a little bit uh, further down the, the session, but connectivity is a big, big piece in the automation. All the systems needs to be connected to somehow to one system and the constant flow of communication back and forth. So, Digital twins, I see digital twins. Uh, I cannot imagine uh, automation system nowadays without having a digital twin. I think especially in the autonomous world, we are moving towards uh, digital twin, twin is, is a, a very good tool that we have in, in designing new automation systems. So I believe, I think we're going to touch on some of those. We've already touched on those, but uh, uh, like I said, this is, this is my type of audience. Glad to hear that. And Related to the automated world that like we're talking about, something we often hear about in this space is the lights out warehouse. And so for those in the audience that don't know that, uh, basically it's a warehouse that is fully automated and doesn't need any stuff inside. So that you can just turn the lights off. Um, we want to know pretty from your experience, where do you see the state of the art going? Are we truly going to see most distribution center to be that way? fully automated or is there something else that it's coming? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm definitely familiar with this term, uh, but I think about this slightly differently. My focus is to make sure we are creating value in the warehouse space is, is basically how I would look at it. As a matter of fact, a lot of my ideas come from warehouse floor, working with associates, working with the warehouse workers, where they're actually providing constructive feedback on how to harden a technology. You know, we bring in our prototypes in a distribution space and we work with the associates in the warehouse and they are actually helping us build and harden this technology. So I have a question for the group. I know you guys can't answer, so I'll answer it myself. Uh, you know, how many of us are actually training our kids to unload a truck in a distribution space? I know I am not, right? So it's it's a hard job. And sometimes you're doing that in extreme cold and hot temperatures. You know, trailers are parked outside at a docking station. And you don't have a much good temperature control there. So in my personal opinion, I would like to transition those roles to a worker who has a touch screen in their hand and controlling X amount of robots that are unloading trailers for them. So maybe we have a touchpad and and the uh, associate is managing four robots, which is unloading the trailer for them. To me, that is the larger focus area than lights out warehouse. We may or may not get to that point, but I think I, I would rather focus on creating immediate value in the warehouses today. That's awesome. I love the perspective of, you know, rather than thinking about it as replacing labor, you know, improving labor, improving the conditions and working with humans yeah. and making us more efficient, you know, all of it. Obviously, you know, we're at the end of the day, we're part of the supply chain and we're kind of the key actors in the supply chain. So improving our the effort that we can put in and getting more out of um, the effort that we put in and making improving the conditions that we have to work in, I think is a great perspective. Um, you know, especially you know, just thinking about the context of you know robotics and robots taking our jobs, if you will. So um, oh, great perspective. Yeah. Awesome. So maybe I'm just taking a look at the time here. I think maybe we have a quick, you know, time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll jump into the audience there. Um, I see there's a bunch of questions in the Q and A, so that's great. Keep keep 
um, bringing those. And also, if you could please use that Q&A feature to bring those questions instead of the, the chat. Um, I see there's some questions there going in the chat. So those who put questions in the chat, if you can move those over to the Q&A and we'll take a look at those in that Q&A feature. Um, so maybe just you know one one more quick question or two more quick questions. Um, sure. and kind of thinking about, you know, we've been talking about like, you know, the hardware side almost, um, or also just like the physical side, the moving of physical products, you know, material handling, if you material handling equipment. There's also the other side of things, which is the information flow, right? You mentioned data, obviously data being a key piece with machine learning. And so we'd love to learn more about the role that um, technology has in the flow of information and how communication can enhance coordination between different players. But thinking about that from an automation perspective, right? And how, um, you know, flow of information and, and coordination um, comes into play um, when you're thinking about automating processes within the distribution center. Absolutely. I think we may have a slide for that one, uh, maybe kind of talking through the data flow. Uh, I think there's a number two slide, if you could. Uh... Yeah, perfect. So I think, uh, good question, Kalen. I think data gathering and flow of information is very important in an end-to-end -end supply chain. You know, different automation systems in warehouse have different software and hardware requirement. But one of the strong consideration for identifying a technology solution in warehouse is its ability to integrate with the WMS network, which is warehouse management systems. You know, this is one master system that is connected to all the automation systems. I don't know if the master system is the right word, but this is how I see it because it's connected with everything in a distribution center, center both upstream and downstream as well, right? purely based on what network, what kind of scale you're looking at. So think of all the multiple operations in the warehouse, you know, loading, unloading, storing, picking, packing, shipping, you know, all these operations, they are connected with smart devices and feeding information back and forth with the WMS system, a warehouse management system. So this is essentially like a one data source that enables coordination and assist in optimization of full end-to-end solution. So if we take a look at the picture here, I think you're kind of looking at a isometric view of a distribution center, essentially where you have loading and unloading on each side, and then you have storing and processing in the middle. So think of any operation in this particular visual, you know, every time you're unloading a trailer, you're scanning a pallet, and this feeds an information to WMS system that, hey, pallet is received, inventory updated. You're storing the items on the on the racks there, you scan it. Now WMS knows, okay, this is my inventory levels. You are preparing a pallet and you're attaching it to uh, associated customer order. So WMS knows, okay, the inventory has been consumed for customer X. Shipment, you're ready to load the trailer, you scan the pallet and you see, okay, this is already dispatched. WMS updated, right? So everything is is residing in that wms system and is constantly feeding information back and forth which is pretty much real time is how you would use some of these uh, systems to kind of integrate and have make sure you have full view of the supply chain not just one particular function awesome thank you for sharing that uh, super clear image and example and as we are getting to the end of the event, I would like to go with uh, asking about what would be your recommendations to those in the program that are starting with us that are looking to involve themselves into implementing automation, um, probably of some pieces of the supply chain or some facilities or in their designs, in their networks, probably when it comes to implementing IoT for improving communication even. Uh, so there are probably lots of considerations and trade-offs to analyze, and we would love to know your advice for them. Absolutely. So I think uh, I, I can understand, you know, designing an automation system could be uh, a daunting task. So it truly kind of starts with the with the problem statement, you know, defining what you're trying to try to solve. Now, one thing I'll strongly recommend is go visit the warehouse. You know, sign up for some of the operations in distribution centers, unload a trailer, depalletize a pallet, kind of live in the shoes of warehouse associate. You know, this will enable you make strong recommendations. Next step is kind of building a hypothesis. 
for example hey if i do certain things this is what i will achieve kind of really building a strong plan and your strong hypothesis having a good understanding of market and solution providers in the automation space is a key advantage i think something that we should strive towards i'll recommend maybe take time in participating in in automation exhibitions you know read any related literature online search you know whatever gets you finding that solution you know there's a lot of information available online these days and and kind of following the 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 stage gate process there onwards so proof of technology proof of concept you know pilots and then eventually look into scaling the most important piece is is to remain objective throughout the process rely on data to make selections and decision so i think uh, uh, i think lot of we had a, a slide on that i think uh, the the minimal viable product so yeah i think if you can kind of focus on the bottom panel of this slide uh so while designing a system all of us have a tendency to design a perfect solution with all the bells and whistles sometimes that approach works and most of the time in my experience it takes longer than anticipated so in this particular case if you look at the bottom panel you know we trying to solve let's say we trying to solve a mobility solution for a customer customer wants to go from point a to point b the standard approach will be like hey let's go design a car but maybe we don't have to design a car and it truly begins with are we understanding the problem of the customer so if pro custom and sometimes customer does know what they what what they want <laughs> so in this particular case let's take an example customer wants to go from point a to point b let's give them a roller board customer hops on it and customer gets from point a to point b problem solved next thing is i'll skip the number 2 next thing is customer comes back and say hey man i i am standing on this roller board i need something to sit on maybe okay i'll give you a, a bicycle you have a seat and and you have to pedal customer comes back and say thank you for giving me the solution i don't like pedaling i don't like the speed the bicycle can go and okay i'll give you a motorbike customer comes back and say thank you for giving me the solution you know what i'm bored with going from point a to point b myself i want to bring my friends right at that point you give them a car so kind of tying it back to designing an automation system is you don't have to design a rolls royce with all the bells and whistles to begin with maybe you start with something simpler and truly understand the need that customer has and keep on give, giving them minimum viable product at every stage this will help you solve the problem create immediate value as well as develop relationship with customer and get to improve your product as you go along the cycle so hopefully it gives you a little bit flavor of you know we don't have to go boil the ocean the very first time That's awesome. I love the uh, the analogy. I guess you'd say you, you just brought there. It's a you know a great perspective or framework you could almost use for a lot of you know projects and oh, yeah. innovation. You know even startups. You know could I think could benefit from that perspective. You know sometimes we have this vision of like this beautiful you know fully electric you know five seater car, but maybe it's not it's too much and it's not necessarily solving directly the problem. And so starting with a a bit more of an mvp and working our way towards that vision maybe the vision changes as we go along you know we understand the customer needs Absolutely. a little better that's a fascinating um analogy awesome so just looking at the time we want to try to um jump in here to the questions that you guys brought there in the audience and so thank you for all those questions um, we have a bunch in there and so we're going to try to get to as many as we can with the time we have left and while we do that if we could launch our third poll here just to kind of see you know what you got out of today's event um you know what you thought the most interesting part was you know maybe expanding your knowledge on automation or learning about specific applications like ai for example um so we'd love to kind of just see what you got out of today's discussion so far and when we do that while you um do that we'll jump in here to the q a and i'll maybe start with just a question here i think it's actually a, a kind of a fascinating question from alejandra that we don't often think about um, which is this the role that international standards can play you know this can have a you know i think a a significant impact in a lot of different areas but you know sometimes like those technology interfaces for example um you know 
to standardize some of those interfaces. Like a simple example might I'm thinking of maybe is like the USB port in our computer, right? That's kind of a so there's a standard there. If we all had different ports for different devices, we wouldn't be able to plug and play as easily. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, again, this question from Alejandra here. Um, what are the role that standards have? It could be international standards like ISO, or it just could be other forms of standards. What role do those standards have in terms of automation in robotics in a DC? Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, that's a very good question. And standards do play a significant role in, as we go from building a solution from incubation space into more mature products, especially, in the emerging tech, I think you will see different companies, different startups kind of working and tackling the problem in different ways. And then in few years down the line, you, you get into a situation, situation where you have three different solutions, but essentially solving the problem the same way. At that point, I think these standards come in very handy, uh, especially in the emerging tech. We don't want standards to limit our ability to innovate, but at the same time, if you are getting beyond incubation spaces, getting into more comfortable level of, okay, now we feel comfortable with these solutions. I don't think of any other way but standardizing some of these solutions and, and kind of, you know, setting up industry standards around it. So good question there. Thank you, Pradeep. And we have so many questions from the audience that I don't think we'll get to all, but let's go with this one from Carlos that I I think it's uh, very interesting. So there are very a lot of questions that are um, bringing the topic of the cost that it has to automate. Um, so you already mentioned that we can start with a, um, a viable model that doesn't have to be the best one or the ultimate one. But they want to know if you could elaborate a little bit more on how to assess and simulate the stages of a possible automated solution. Um, considering it's a very critical point, um, there's a lot of immense investment to make and it's a hard decision. Um, how, how would you work on assessing the potential performance of anything you're implementing? I think something to strongly consider would be, if I'm understanding the question, would be how do you simulate, build simulations of the solutions you are you are going to go solve. I say if you're designing a, a line and you want to run a certain amount of production through that particular line, and there's a lot of contributing, there's multiple factors to that automation systems that sometimes it's very difficult to build mathematical models or do just figure it out by designing an AutoCAD layout or 3D models. There are a lot of good uh, simulation tools out there in the industry which can help you actually simulate the environment that you are building. You can actually simulate that, hey, I'm running 100 cases per hour. You can actually simulate that you have a robot which is actually building pallets and is generating 1,000 cases per hour and, and see all these things in simulation in in a in an integrated way in that way you can use these simulations either to get leadership buy in or either to get uh, some of the cost analysis done so you don't have to go manufacture and prototype these things uh, if the business case isn't there so simulation softwares and simulation tools are actually come in very handy uh, before you go and spend uh, a lot of money on a on a prototyping uh, type of solution Awesome. That's uh, I have a question I want to build off, build on off yeah, that a yeah. little bit. But maybe before we jump into the next question, um, if we could share the results of our poll and just take a quick look at our poll results here today. And the question was, you know, what was the most interesting part of today's um, session for you? It looks like um, most, you know, just expanding knowledge, general knowledge, and automation and distribution centers. And that's great. Also, understanding the impact of technology and supply chain functions. And that's awesome, Pradeep. I don't know if you have any thoughts on those poll results, or we'll jump into the next no, question. This is, no, this is good. I, uh, I mean, I, I hope uh, we're creating value for the audience here. So that's good. Awesome. So with that, maybe I'll jump into the next question here, kind of building on the idea of simulation, uh, but then maybe taking it almost into a more of a real-time simulation, if you will, um, or, or just a technology that's somewhat similar, which is this concept of digital twins. You know, I know it's a lot of companies oh, yeah. and a lot of, you know, in the ecosystem, it's kind of a buzzword also, you know, it's just a, you know, a, a technology that's getting a lot of attention right now. I don't know if you could share your experience and perspective on the use of um, digital twins. And again, this is a question here that I lost it in my thread here, but it's a question actually from Nitin in the audience here. I'm just asking your 
um, learnings from implement, implementing digital twins or just the the value or the opportunity that digital twins bring? Absolutely. Now, I think we're working on a very complicated problem solving automation world where it's not just one parameter that you are going to automate. There's going to be multiple parameters you need to consider. And digital twins is essentially to me is kind of simulating that environment in, in 3D. And this is what, so maybe I'll give you an example. I think autonomous cars is, an, is, a, is, a, is a good example. You know, when autonomous car is, is running and don't quote me on it, I'm not the expert, but I'll give you the, the gist of it is, you know, autonomous car when it's running, it has, you know, cameras and sensors on it. Essentially what it's doing is actually building a digital twin of what the car is seeing in the front of it. And if there's any obstacles and things on the road and, the car knows, okay, here's an obstacle, I'm going to go around it, or hey, I'm going to stop and things like that. Very similar in the automation world as well. And this is exactly what digital uh, twin lets us do, is simulate what a robot or a vision system is seeing in an automation system. And accordingly orchestrate the movement of multiple MHE components in that particular, let's say, robotic cell. So everything works in kind of like somebody is running an, running an orchestra and everybody knows what they're singing out of, right? So it's truly looking at the dynamic environment and finding a solution in that. So in other words, I don't see a way for us to design an automation system, the complexity of the automation system we're designing without a digital twin. Thank you for sharing that, Pradeep. And definitely we encourage the audience to take a look uh, a little bit deeper on digital twins because as part is said it's it's becoming much more important in so many different yeah. aspects that are related to our supply chains um so there are a lot of questions regarding this but i'm taking the one from ahab if i'm pronouncing that well um they want to know about what are the challenges or what are those main challenges that you identify when it comes to automating distribution centers and processes and if you can talk about them as bottlenecks but or challenges but what is it that you have to deal with when you're going to automate a distribution center? Yeah, I think there's the problem could be looked at uh, multiple ways is sometimes kind of I've said it a few times is truly understanding the problem. Sometimes, you know, you we, we think we know the problem, but once we are asked to put it on a piece of paper, then, then we start thinking, okay, do I really know, know the problem, right? Really able to quantify the problem is actually the majority of the challenge. Once you're able to do that, I think the next step is whether we have the solutions available in the market or not. I think we, we kind of spoke about make versus buy, but sometimes the right solution lives right in the middle that maybe I have to build a part of solution and maybe I need to go work with somebody else. And it's, it's more of a, a combined effort to get to a solution. It's not a binary selection of, Either I have a supply or either I'm going to build it internally. Nowadays, with the complexity of the solution that we're dealing, maybe there's a combination to coexist there and develop it together, right? So to me, those are some of the challenges is truly finding the solution, truly defining the problem and how are you going to go solve it? And then the biggest challenge is we want to solve the problem today and we're not ready for that. Like how can we quickly go deploy these these systems obviously without compromising on on safety and all that but uh, the the speed to to automation i think uh, is is some of the the for like a better word pain points for me when i'm looking at the industry and designing some of the automation systems in the distribution space awesome thank you pradeep um, so just taking a look at the the time here i think we probably have time we have so many questions in the q and a that maybe we have time to pull in a couple more here before we before we close things off, um, and one area I think this is a great question. Uh, another question looks like here from Alejandra. I think this is a, a fascinating challenge. Maybe um, I'm wondering your perspective on it. Is just the if you think about the end consumer distribution, right, where you're delivering like eaches or individual products, maybe to an, an end consumer um, instead of you know, moving cases and pallets where things are maybe a little bit more standardized, if you will. With that eaches or that end consumer individual product um, distribution, you have such a diversity or variety of products and packaging and sizes and shapes and changing, you know, packaging types and changing formats and all that kind of stuff. And I'm wondering, you know, 
Alejandro's question here is about image recognition and how um, image recognition maybe can help tackle this challenge, but maybe there's also other technologies or approaches to help you know tackle this challenge of just the the complexity of the product packaging and product sizing within that um, individual or each distribution um, network. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a very good question. I think the largest complexity lies on the each space, is the each picking space, because you have just tons of varieties of SKUs that you can automate and they all look different. So the vision technology definitely plays a very strong role in it. Uh, but just solving the vision does not solve the problem. So if I look at the automation system, I can kind of categorize that into three categories. Vision is obviously one and very important one. Second one is, is the hardware of it. And third one is mobil mobility of it. So let me elaborate on that. Like vision is like you have a camera uh, and you're looking at the, the items, let's say kind of the example I gave for toothbrush, you're looking at hundred different items. Is your vision system efficiently able to identify each of those hundred things in the in the bin? How accurately it's identifying is is the is is the vision system category? And then the hardware piece of it is, okay, now my system is able to see it. Can I go actually go pick it up efficiently without dropping it? So that's where the hardware comes in. And let's say you have. Uh, different products in it. Some of them are corrugated products. Some of them are non-corrugated products. Some of them are packed in poly. Some of them are different, like this different physical parameters of that products. So can one hardware solve that problem or maybe you need different hardware to solve that problem. You're able to see it, but you're not able to pick it up, right? So, and the third thing is after you have, let's say you solve the picking of it. Now, how do you move it? Where are you moving it? How are you going to move it? Are you packing it in in a in a bag or a box to to ship it to the end customer right so uh to to answer the question coming back to it uh is vision definitely i think there's much more scope and improvement in the vision especially in the each each picking space uh but we have to kind of look at holistically vision hardware and mobility of it to actually solve that but truly understand i think in the each space the the complexity is, is higher Thank you, Pradeep. And I'm not sure if this is the last question or probably we can make one more, but okay. I want to go with Sandeep's um, question. And just in case you have any experience on this, because we haven't talked about this technology in particular, um, how do you see the introduction of drone technology into warehouse automation for different type of activities? I think uh, that's a that's a very important technology which is getting a good adaptability in overall supply chain in distribution space something i do not have direct exposure to but i'm i'm aware that there are few companies and few other solution providers out there who are using drones inside the distribution space and then there are obviously the the last mile delivery piece of using drones and and delivering you know customers orders through through drones is is a technology which has been implemented. Uh, that being said, I do not have ex direct exposure to it, but I see, I see the feasibility of it. I see the application of it in few areas in the distribution centers where this can be further explored. Awesome. Yeah, drones, you know, it's another one of those kind of buzzwords almost. And sometimes you see pictures of, you know, like warehouses that are. You know, high technology yeah. warehouses and there's a drone flying around you know but often some of the solutions are really more uh i guess physical infrastructure rather than like a mobile robot in a warehouse but um yeah. so yeah. that's uh, interesting to hear that you don't have too much um experience in it but that there may there's opportunity there to explore for sure um there's definitely really opportunities there yeah there's definitely opportunities there i think uh i've seen some prototypes is is, is the limited exposure i have i don't i have not uh, you know played played with that uh, directly Awesome. So maybe I think just looking at the time, I think probably we have time for one more question at least. And there's many questions in the uh, Q&A here. And appreciate all your, your thoughts and input there from the audience. Um, so I'm just going to pull a question here from Susanta. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly there. But um, this kind of goes to one of the comments you made earlier, Pardeep, about you know, bringing the human into the conversation. You know, we're talking about automation and technology and, you know, robotic arms and drones and all this kind of stuff. But 
bringing the human into the conversation. Um, and often, you know, maybe there's a synergy or an opportunity for a synergy there between um, the automation, the technology, and then also the humans who are involved in um, these processes. And so I'm wondering if you could just, you know, share a little bit more about how you approach that synergy, right? The synergy between the technology and the humans involved, um, you know, whether it's, you know, cobots or whatever those, whatever that synergy looks like, if you could just share a little bit more about that synergy there. Absolutely. I think cobots specifically do not have much exposure to that. I've definitely, I have other team team members who are more focused on that, but from this synergy standpoint, I, I definitely see a very strong potential. I think that's exactly where my focus is, is how do we build more synergies? How do we have the warehouse workers use the technology more in the distribution space? Truly identifying the, the pain points faced by the warehouse workers, kind of like what I was, you know, we kind of touched on that earlier, uh, lifting heavy boxes or walking 10, 20, 30 miles in a warehouse just because you're doing a certain operations. How do we take that task away and make them more using the technology, kind of you know, build that synergy so we can actually creating value. So we have four robotics arm working and the warehouse worker is helping me make sure the, you know, we kind of touched on asset availability make sure how they are interacting with those systems to make sure that asset availability is, is, you know, assets are fully utilized. Assets are always available or go address some of the interventions and address some of these anomalies, address any unentitled volume going through those systems. So having, building those synergies where a human interact with these automation equipment is to me is the, is the way to go. At least that's kind of my focus area right now. So, that's how I would look at it. I don't know if Kellen that answered your question or not. I think so. And I want to, in the interest of time, I thank you for this insightful conversation. We've learned a lot from you, from your experience. And we love to see how you apply a lot of concepts that we sometimes just learn about or hear about or are buzzwords in the news. Uh, so we truly appreciate learning that from you and your expertise. I want to give you the word in case you have any final comments to our audience. No, well, I, I appreciate, I know all of us are, are busy and uh, carving out uh, one hour of time to, to listen to this session. Hopefully you walked away with one or two things you liked or something you can go implement in your roles or education. So I truly appreciate uh, everyone's time and uh, I'm sure uh, we'll find a way to, to connect uh, with each other. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you guys for the for the opportunity here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Pradeep. Appreciate you sharing your time as well. I know an hour is uh, hard to carve out for all of us, and I appreciate you carving out an hour to share with us and all the preparation that went into this, this event today. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for sharing your perspective and our polls and all the questions you brought there. I know there's way more questions than we were able to get to in our short amount of time. I appreciate you you know, thinking about the topic and, and sharing your, your questions and, and thoughts there as well. And Laura, uh, thank you for co-hosting with me today. Awesome. Thank you. It's always fun to co-host with you and to learn together from our experts. You all know this is the last webinar on our winter series and our courses are coming to an end too, but stay tuned to the social media from our MicroMasters program for any upcoming season uh, and series of webinars. Uh, thank you everyone and see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you guys.